إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل لا ومن يضلل فلا هادي لا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Then I welcome you, my brothers and sisters, as I hear the sister's area is open to a limited degree, alhamdulillah. So that gives them the opportunity to enter and benefit. Uh, so today, we begin here at Al Masjid al Salafi, here on Wright Street in Small Heath in Birmingham. Today being the 16th of July, a Thursday, in the year 2020, which coincides with the 25th of Dhul Qa'ada in the year 1441 after the Hijrah of Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we begin today a book that I don't recall covering since uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, Allahu A'lam. Uh, but since then, walillahi alham, this book, it has had several explanations that have proceeded from the major scholars and its importance is as great today as it was when it was first put together or mentioned or recited and penned down by the great A'imma of the Salaf as they took from their Shaykh, the Imam of Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah and he is Abu Abdullah Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Hanbal Rahimahullahu Ta'ala. So the work that we are going to begin inshallah today is the explanation of Usul al-Sunnah, or Sharh, Usul al-Sunnah, of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullahu ta'ala, as we mentioned, the great scholar of al-Islam, the great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah, and we will mention something, inshallah, before we actually embark upon the book, something of his biography or something of his efforts in ilm and knowledge and teaching and his students and those that he studied with and so on. So the explanation that we're taking primarily is the explanation of Sheikh Ahmed bin Yahya and Najmi rahimahullahu ta'ala in his explanation in his Shar'u Sul Sunnah of Ahmed bin Yahya and Najmi rahimahullahu ta'ala from the great scholars of Al-Islam of our era. And as further benefits, Insha'Allah, I will reach out to some other works of some of the other scholars. From them, Al-Allama Zayd bin Muhammad Al-Madkhali, Rahimahullah, and the Imam of our era, or one of the Imams and the A'imma of our era, Al-Allama Rabi bin Hadi, Umair Al-Madkhali, Hafizahullah Ta'ala from the great scholars, the carrier of the flag of Al-Jarh wa Ta'adil, the Muhaddith, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, one of the great scholars of hadith of our era who resides in Medina. And there are, of course, other explanations, as I mentioned, that I will be reaching out to and some of the aqwal of Ahlul Ilm so as to give tabiyin and tawdih, so as to give explanation and clarity to this tremendous work. And it is needed. As I mentioned at the beginning that this work is as important today as it was when it was first compiled. And in reality, maybe that's a shortfall in my description. I would say, and Allah knows best, it is more important now than it was in that time. Why? Because in the time of Imam Ahmed, there were a'imma, 
and the great scholars of Al-Islam from the early Salaf. And many of the scholars that they defended the borders that were encroached upon by Ahlul Bid'ah of the Sunnah. So they encroached upon the borders of the Sunnah and they tried to dilute and to challenge the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So these ulama, they, wrote, they rose up and they defended the haqq. And from them is Imam Ahmed. In our times, we have imams and we have scholars without doubt. We have Sheikh Al-Fawzan and Sheikh Rabi'a and Sheikh Abdul Muhsin. And we have Sheikh Ubaid and other than them. But of the caliber of the early Salaf, then no. Are they imams today? Yes. Are they great scholars? Yes. But the scholars of today rely upon the works of the early Salaf. And they draw upon them. And they clarify it. But deviation from the time of the Salaf to our times has increased. It has not decreased. And there are more ignorant people today who ascribe themselves to Islam than they were in those times. So therefore, the teaching of these books is from the most important matters and from the great affairs that the carriers of this da'wah First and foremost, the ulama, then their students, and the du'at. It is upon them to clarify these works, to explain these works, to read these works. Using as a foundation the explanations of the scholars, and not from their own thoughts or ideas. In the opening of this book, in the muqaddimah, of, which is, and the muqaddimah of course compiled by the verifiers, and those who compiled this work from the from the recordings of Sheikh Ahmed the Najmi. So they compiled this work and they put it together and they gave it a muqaddimah in explanation, meaning an introduction. And that introduction is important so we get an insight into what we're about to embark upon. So after uh, mentioning Allah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, that the authors or the verifiers and the compilers they mention a statement which is, of course, apt and worthwhile and worthy at this particular place. And that is a statement of Imam Ahmed himself from his opening to his tremendous work, another one of his works in Aqeedah also, because this is a work in Aqeedah that we embark on. Surah Sunnah is a work in Aqeedah, Foundations of the Sunnah, if you, want, if you wish to translate it into English, Foundations of the Sunnah. But he has another work also in Aqeedah. Al-Raddu ala al-Jahmiyyati wa zanadiqa So this is a, ref a refutation or the refutation upon the Jahmiyyah and the Zanadiqa, the, her the, the heretics. So at the beginning of that work, he says the following words or that he mentions the following words. He says that all praise is due to Allah who in every age between the messengers raises up a group from the people of knowledge. Those who call the ones who are misguided to guidance and they bear patiently the harm that they receive. And these scholars, they give life by the book of Allah the Most High to those who have died. And by it, by the light of Allah, they give sight to the blind. So how many killed by Iblis have they given life to? And how many astray have they guided? And how fine has been their effect upon the people? And how vile have the people been towards them, meaning the people of opposition to the Sunnah? It is these scholars who expel from the Book of Allah the tahrif of the ghalin or the distortions of those who go beyond bounds and the assertions of the mubtilin, of the liars and the ta'wil al-jahileen 
and the false interpretations of the ignorant. This is what the scholars, they do. Then he said, those who uphold the banner of innovation and let loose the reins of discord and trial and they differ concerning the book of Allah and they oppose the book of Allah and they are in agreement they are in, in, in agreement in their departing from the book and they speak about Allah and they speak concerning Allah and concerning the book of Allah without knowledge they discuss and they debate using the unclear and ambiguous speech they deceive the ignorant people using that which is unclear and ambiguous to them so we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the fitna of the misguided so this is the opener explaining the role of the alim and the scholar and the ulama in every age between the messengers and after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is no different it is the scholars who are raised in every generation my brothers and sisters who call them misguided to guidance those who by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they give sight to the blind because the ignorant ones are blind they have no ilm, they have no insight, they have no basira so the scholars they open their eyes and they open their hearts how many my brothers and sisters have been killed by Iblis meaning that their hearts have been killed and corrupted by Iblis then Allah guides these individuals to an alim to an imam of the sunnah as the Salaf used to say like Ayyub Sakhtiani and Yusuf bin Asbaq that they would say that we were born into families like Yusuf bin Asbat, he spoke regarding his father and his paternal uncles and how they were Rafida or they were Khawarij or they were Qadariya and then Allah guided me by way of Sufyan so Allah raises raises these lighthouses and illuminaries of ilm these mountains just like when you can see a mountain as a landmark in the distance and you know you need to head towards that mountain because that is the way home. So these are landmarks, milestones. The ulama of al-Islam. And how much they give of their time and their effort to, to the people. How many astray by the permission of Allah do they guide? People who are wandering, following the shayateen from amongst mankind and jinn. And how vile the people are towards them in their speech. That they clear the way. And they uncover that which is hidden. And then the response of the people towards them is nothing but revilement. How vile they are. But these individuals, they have been raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the ones who resemble the prophets, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that those who are tried the most are the prophets, and then those who resemble them, then those who resemble them. So the scholars are tried. If the prophets were, were tried, then are, 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 are the scholars not going to be tried? So these scholars of the early Salaf, and we are talking about the Mutaqaddimeen, the earliest of the scholars of Al Islam reaching right back to the first, second and third century, entering into the fourth century. Because that was the golden era of Al-Islam. The era in which the books of Hadith and the books of Aqeedah and the books of Fiqh and the religion, it was codified and it was gathered, the narrations were put together 
That was the era of Imam al-Bukhari in terms of compilation of Hadith and Muslim and Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi and Nasa'i ibn Majah. Before them, Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his compilation of the Musnad. Before him, Imam Malik in the compilation of the Muatta. And after him, the compilation of Al-Musnad of Imam Shafi and others. That these ulama, they, they gathered the works and they gathered the narrations of the early Salaf. Then you had those scholars among them, amongst the ones that I've named, who also wrote books in Aqidah. And the purpose of those books in Aqidah was to keep the religion pristine and pure so that people can keep drinking from that pure, pristine well. The Kitab and the Sunnah and the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So the title of this book, Usul Sunnah. The foundations of the Sunnah and the, and the term Sunnah here, the intent behind it is the Aqidah. Or the intent behind it is Islam. Because of course, when we use the term Sunnah, it can have various connotations in the mind. Like you would say, using the Siwak is a Sunnah, meaning that it is recommended. Or you would say that these are the two Sunnah for Fajr. Because what is intended here is that the Prophet wasallam used to do these acts that are recommended. Or the Sunnah can mean Islam itself. As in the statement, in the, what, the earlier point or one of the first points, in the Sharh al-Sunnah of Imam al-Barbahari, when he stated, and know that Islam is the Sunnah, and the Sunnah is Islam, and one cannot be established except with the other. So what is the intent of Barbahari there? That Islam is the Sunnah, and the Sunnah, it is Islam in totality. Meaning that you cannot divide the two. The Sunnah here is the, in, in this context is the Aqidah and the methodology. Aqidah and manhaj. And you would say, well, how do you know? As you go through the book, you realize he's not talking about the Sunan of Fajr or the Sunan of Ar-Rawatib that you pray before Dhuhr or after Dhuhr or before Fajr or the Witr or the Tahajjud or the fasting on Monday and Thursday. Imam Ahmad is not talking about those issues, though they are important as far as the religion and ibadah is concerned. But he intends by the foundations of the Sunnah is the foundations of Islam. Meaning the aqidah, the usul of the deen, that which the religion is built upon. And if you don't have these foundations, you have no religion. If you do not have aqidah, you have no Islam. And this is why tawheed is the first thing that the prophets and the messengers used to call to. Because the tawheed is the aqidah of the Muslim. That is the belief of the Muslim upon which everything is built. This aqidah. Sometimes we call it Iman. That's why some of the Salaf used to call their books Kitabul Iman. So this term as Sunnah here, the scholars would give their books the title as Sunnah. And their intent was to clarify the Aqidah of the Muslims and to refute Ahlul Bid'ah, Ahlul Ahwa, Az Zanadiqa, Ahlul Zayg. So sometimes the intent of these works is also usul sunnah as in these are the foundations of the sunnah in opposition to the people of bid'ah. Why? Because the opposite of sunnah is what? Bid'ah. So the bid'ah of the mukhalifin or the innovations of the opposers of the sunnah so therefore these books of sunnah are written to clarify this is the sunnah and what thereupon is bid'ah. So therefore you'll find in these works such as As-Sunnah or Kitab As-Sunnah why have a title that the scholars give them? Sharh As-Sunnah, Asul As-Sunnah you'll find that these works are written to clarify to the Muslim to which Muslim? Is it only for the scholars? No, for the average Muslim for the general Muslim as well as for the student of knowledge as well as for the ulama who come after them this is the sunnah. Anything that you see in opposition to what I have written, then that is bid'ah. This is the intent of a sunnah of Imam Ahmad. That is the intent of a sunnah of Al-Khalal. That is the intent of a sunnah of Ibn Abi Asim and so on. 
The intent of these scholars is that what we have written is the sunnah that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died upon in terms of the aqeedah, in terms of the methodology, in terms of the path that he was upon. Because the term sunnah also carries the connotation of path, a tariq, or a tariqa, a path. A path to what? A path that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was upon. So when we say Ahlu Sunnah, we are referring to the people who follow the Sunnah of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning the religion that he came with, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, the path that he was upon. And that path is in opposition to Bid'ah and to the other Subal and to the paths of Ahlul Bid'ah. So therefore, when we say a Sunnah, we are talking about the path that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was upon or the belief that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba were upon, or the religion that Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Sahaba radiyallahu anhum were upon. So their intent in the penning down of these treatises was to clarify the aqeedah of the Muslims and to refute the opposite of the Sunnah, which is Bid'ah and its people. So it is the belief of Ahlu Sunnah in opposition to the path of the people of bid'ah and misguidance. So quite often you'll find books of creed and manhaj of the early salaf, because that's what we're concerned with. We are concerned with what the early salaf were upon, what the early generations of Muslims were upon, because the earlier you are and the closer you are to the life of Allah's Messenger وسلم, and his sahaba, the closer you are to the purity of Islam. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of mankind is my generation. Then those who come after them, then those who come after them. In a narration, one of the Sahaba, he said, that I do not remember whether he said it for the fourth time, meaning the first four generations. They are the best and they are the most excellent. This is why you find the greatest of the scholars of Al-Islam, that they are from that era. And this is why you find the latter-day the, the latter scholars or the scholars of the Middle Ages and the scholars of today that when they would speak and when they do speak they say and this was the qawl of the Salaf and this is what the Salaf were upon and this is what the Salaf used to believe and this is what the Salaf used to say and this is how the Salaf used to live why? because our concern is with those early generations of Muslims the first three generations in specific and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum being at the head of them in terms of a society that was raised upon the purity and the perfection and the excellence of Islam. So they would write these books and they would give it the title as Sunnah, such as Asul as Sunnah of Imam Ahmed, Rahimahullah, died in 241 after the Hijrah. Or As Sunnah of Al Athram, one of his students, Book of Aqeedah, died in 273. Kitab al Sunnah of Abu Dawood as Sijistani, the compiler of the Sunan, and it is a part of his Sunan, died in 275. Kitab al-Sunnah, again, a book of Sunnah, Kitab al-Sunnah of Ibn Abi Asim, died in 287. A book of methodology and creed and refutation of Ahlul Bidah, the Qadariya, the Khawarij, the Murjiya, the Jahmiya, refutes all of them. Aslu Sunnah wa Atiqad al-Deen, of the Raziyain, commonly known as Asl Sunnah, of the two Razis, we've studied it. Abu Zura and Abu Hatim, al Raziyain. Abu Zura died in 277, Abu Hatim in 264, from the students of Imam Ahmed, by the way, again. Likewise, As Sunnah of Al Marwazi died in 292, another one of the students of Imam Ahmed. Likewise, Kitab al Sunnah that we're studying every Friday. Of who? Ibn Majah. Rahimahullah. At the beginning of his Sunan, he begins with Kitab al Sunnah. Died in the year 273. What is it? You've, those of you who have sat in those durus, what is it? It is methodology and the creed and the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah. The importance of referring back to that which the Sahaba were upon and how the Sahaba were with Ahlul Bid'ah. 
and what the position of the Salaf was towards the Khawarij, as you'll find out as we go through that tremendous work, Kitab Sunnah of Ibn Majah. Likewise, Sarih Sunnah, again, Sarih Sunnah of Ibn Jarir al Tabari, died in 310. A Sunnah of Al Khalal, again, from the companions of the students of Imam Ahmed, died in 311. And likewise, Sharh al Sunnah of Imam al Barbahari, Rahimahullah, died in 329 from the companions of the senior students of Imam Ahmed, like Al Marruthi and others. Then As Sunnah of Al Asal died in 349. As Sunnah of Al Tabarani died in 360. And others. What's the point I'm making? That when these people come along and say, well, you know, he wasn't really a a major issue amongst the Salaf to write about books of Aqidah and books of methodology and books of, you know, refutation of Ahlul Bidah, then what is all this? And we haven't even scratched the surface. Then you have voluminous works also. And then you have works that I haven't come, works that don't mention the term Sunnah in the title, but they are nevertheless books of Aqidah. So then you have those books that cover the same topics, Aqidah, meaning creed, the belief, the methodology, refutation of Ahlul Bid'ah, clarifying the path, the Sabil al Mu'mineen, the path of the believers, Sirat al Mustaqim, the, the straight path of the companions of Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those books, likewise, same subject matter as a Sulu Sunnah, same subject matter of a Sunnah, of Al Khalal or Kitab al Sunnah of Ibn Abi Asim. But the title is different. So, yeah, for example, Kitab al-Tawheed of Ibn Khuzayma. A tremendous work. Kitab al-Tawheed, a book in Aqidah. Died in the year 311. Again, early Salaf, Mutqaddimeen. Kitab al-Iman. Kitab al-Iman, a book with the title Al-Iman of Ibn Manda, 395. Al-Sharia of Imam al-Ajurri. Died in 360. Tremendous work explained by the scholars from them in our time, Sheikh Rabi'ah, in four or five volumes, four volumes that I recall, the explanation of the Sharia of Imam al-Ajuri. Also, Al-Ha'iyya, Manzumat Al-Ha'iyya of Ibn Abi Dawood, Al-Sijistani, Rahimahullah, died in 316, 36 lines, or 40 lines, as some of the scholars have said, in poetry, in clarification of the Aqeedah. Defending the Sunnah, establishment of the Sunnah, the Aqeedah talks about the speech of Allah, about Iman, about the attributes of Allah, defense of the Sahaba, refutation of the Khawarij, refutation of the Shia, refutation of the Murjia, refutation of the Jahmiyyah. In 40 lines, eight or nine explanations just from the scholars of this era. From them, Sheikh Zayd al Madkhali, from them, Sheikh al Fawzan and others. Died in the year 316, by the way, Ibn Abi Dawood, the Sijistani, the son of the Sahib al-Sunan, Abu Dawood. Likewise, Aqeedah al-Salaf, Ashab al-Hadith. So here we have the Aqeedah of the Salaf, Ashab al-Hadith. Again, from the early Salaf, Imam al-Sabuni, rahimahullah ta'ala, died in the year 449 after the Hijrah. A book that is studied and referred to, and the latter and the latter day scholars they referred to it as a book that clarifies the belief of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. Then you have the encyclopedia of Aqidah that gathers the aqaid and the beliefs and the creed of the early Salaf, Sharh Asul Ittiqad, wa Sharh Asul Al Ittiqad Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah of Imam Al-Lalakai rahimahullah ta'ala who died in the year 418 after the Hijrah. In this book, he brings all, any time that he quotes the Aqeedah of the Salaf, then he'll bring his chain of narration going back to Al-Thawri, Sufyan Al-Thawri from 161. So what he's done is, he's compiled the belief and the creeds or the i'tiqad of the early Salaf. So he's now referring back to the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een. So he'll say that this is the creed of Sufyan al-Thawri and he brings his chain of narration going back to Sufyan al-Thawri, 161 after the Hijrah. 
or the creed of Imam al awzai with this chain of narration going back to Imam al awzai he died 157 after the Hijrah. Or this is the Aqeedah of Imam al-Bukhari. Going back to Imam al-Bukhari, he died 256 after the Hijrah. And in those words that he gathers, you see a strengthening, a unity, and a united creed and belief that the early Salaf were upon, that they did not differ upon, in Iman, in Qadr, in the attributes of Allah, in the names of Allah, with regard to the Quran being Kalamullah, Ghair Mukhluq, with regard to their belief in the Sahaba, with regard to the Ulu of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with regard to seeing the face of Allah, Yawm al Qiyamah, the Ru'ya, with regard to the Mizan or the, or the scales that will be set up, Yawm al Qiyamah, or the Sirat, the bridge over the hellfire, or their belief with regard to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that they are to be loved and not a single one of them is to be criticized. With regard to the khawarij, that the ruler, whether he be pious or whether he be a tyrant, that he is not to be rebelled against. This is, this is what these books, they contain. Solidifying the aqidah so that no one has an excuse to claim afterwards that I did not know. Book after book, writing after writing, statement after statement, Imam al he brings. Likewise, al-ibana. Al-Sughra and Al-Kubra of Ibn Batta rahimahullah ta'ala who died in the year 387 after the Hijra from the great A'imma of the early Salaf again compilation of Afar narration after narration after narration of the early Salaf with regard to the Sunnah with regard to the Aqeedah with regard to Bid'ah with regard to their censuring and rebuking and refuting of Bid'ah and its people and that's just me, you know, this is just the, the, you know, just the tip of the iceberg. It would take days, literally, just to go through the asanid and the chains and the, and the i'tiqadat that, that, that Imam Al-Laleka, he brings in his Sharh Usul Al-Tiqad. Never mind some of the other scholars, like Ibn Sa'ad and other than them. Never mind those who came a century after them. We haven't even gone past. The fourth, the, the four hundreds yet. We haven't entered into the into the sixth century. But this is just the beginning of the fourth, four hundred and eighteen al lalakai. So that's the fifth century. Then there were those scholars who wrote, and they were numerous from the early Salaf. So a person doesn't imagine to himself, yeah, but you're quoting latter day, middle ages, seventh century, eighth century, Ibn Taymiyyah, and so on. Though they were great mountains of ilm. In their own right, the likes of Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his student ibn al-Qayyim and the rest of them, Imam al-Zahabi and others, who wrote tremendous works. All of them. But we are now clinging to the early Salaf because ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, is basing everything that he speaks about in his books upon these a'imma. This is where he's getting it from. This is not Ibn Taymiyyah sitting there and seeing the Asha'ira and the Jahmiyyah and the Mu'tazila and the Sufiyyah and the Quburiyyah and the Qadariyyah and other than them and thinking to himself, let me go back and figure out how to refute these people. That's not what Ibn Taymiyyah is doing. Ibn Taymiyyah is going back to these early Salaf and referring to their writings and to their refutations and to the clarity that they brought and to the path that they made clear for the later generations. This is what the scholars of the Middle Ages did. Then the scholars who came after them two centuries ago or a century ago, two centuries ago, the likes of Sheikh Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, they did the same thing. They reached right back into the early Salaf. Sheikh Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab would use the books of Ibn Taymiyyah to help him reach the early Salaf. It was the early Salaf that they were concerned with. So anyone who speaks today if he is not speaking with the speech of the early Salaf, then he is of no concern to us. And we are not interested. We are not interested in sophistry. We are not interested in philosophy or rhetoric or placing the aql over that which the Salaf were upon in terms of the naql, of the revelation. Their concern, the early Salaf, was to preserve that which the Prophet Sallallahu and his Sahaba radiallahu anhum were upon. 
That's why these books are of such importance and that is why these books are not taught by Ahlul Bidat today. This is why they don't teach these books. This is why they don't enter into them because this refutes what they themselves are upon in terms of their false ideology. So yes, there were scholars who clarified the aqeed, they refuted Ahlul Bidat and they would give their books titles that showed the fact that they were refuting Ahlul Bidat and they did not care. Like for example, that which we mentioned from Imam Ahmed. A rad ala al jahmiya wa zanadiqa. A refutation of the jahmiya and the zanadiqa. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, 241, he died. And other than that, there were other scholars. Like for example, the famous rad known as Naqdu Uthman bin Sa'id ala al marisi al jahmi al anid fi maftara. Of Imam al Darimi, rahimahullah, died in 280. Look at the title. A critique from Uthman bin Sa'id, meaning this great Imam al Darimi. His critique upon Al Marisi, Al Jahmi, Al Anid. This Marisi, meaning Bishr Al Marisi who was an innovator, a mubtadi', jahmi, denier of the attributes of Allah, a deceitful, zindiq, al-anid, the one who was stubborn, stubbornly obstinate upon, upon his misguidance. In his iftira, in his fabrications and lies upon Allah, in the meaning in the Tawheed, meaning in the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Imam Udarimi, 280 after the Hijrah. So what was the belief of the Salaf? What was the path of the Salaf? Not to criticize, not to clarify, not to explain, not to make clear the straight path, and to allow people to just wonder, was that the path of Ahmed, Ibn Abi Asim, Al-Marwazi, Sufyan al-Thawri, Hamad ibn Zayd, for Dale, what was their path? To let the people just wonder as they wish? Well, you have your belief, I have my belief, it doesn't matter, Akhi, let's just unite against the Romans. That was their belief? Is that what Ahmed was upon? Is that what Ali, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi was upon? Imam Shafi'i was upon? Imam Malik was upon? Abu Hanifa was upon? Is that what they were upon? Just to allow people to just wonder? And not correct them, not to make clear to the people, be careful of the Jahmiya, be careful of the Murji'ah, be careful of the Khawarij, be careful of the Mu'tazila, be careful of the Qadariya, be careful of the Jabriya. That was their way. And they would clarify, this is the creed of the Muslims, so do not fall into misguidance. So they are the A'imma of the early Salaf. They are Ahlul Hadith. When you say, who are Ahlul Hadith? These are Ahlul Hadith. So when Imam Ahmed was, you know, in one of his statements, when he said, when he was asked about the saved sect, he said, if they are not Ahlul Hadith, then I do not know who they are. Meaning that it is Ahlul Hadith. It is these names and these men and hundreds other than them, if not thousands besides them. They are Ahlul Hadith. They are the ones who took on the mantle of clarifying the truth, preserving the hadith, that which is weak from that which is sahih. That which is the correct aqeedah from that which has been introduced from the ideas of the Greeks or the Hindus or the philosophers other than them or from the enemies of Islam such as Abdullah ibn Sabah from the, from the founders of the Shia or the founder of the Shia and the Khawarij in all of their forms. So these scholars, they came along and they said, we will protect for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah raised them as Imam Ahmed said. They are the Ta'ifatul Mansura in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La tazalu ta'ifatun min ummati. That they shall never cease to be a Ta'ifa, a group from my ummah. Upon the truth, they are manifest. 
and they are not harmed by those who forsake them nor by those who differ with them up until the command of Allah comes and they will be as such when the command comes meaning when the final hour comes they will be like that or when the descent of Isa comes they will still be like that upright upon the truth Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah ta'ala from the great Imma from the compilers of the Sunan he mentioned this hadith of the, of the aided group and the victorious group and he said the Ali al-Madini from the companions of Imam Ahmed and you'll hear more about Ali, Ali al-Madini inshallah next week Ali al-Madini from the companions of Imam Ahmed he said that they are Ahlul Ilm wal Athar they are the people of knowledge and they are the people of narrations it is these men it is these great scholars they are Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah so have we mentioned we said that they are the Salaf we said at the beginning they are the Salaf of this Ummah when we say Madhab of the Salaf that's what we are referring to they say what are you? say you're Salafi say what Madhab do you follow? Madhab of the Salaf so what is the Madhab of the Salaf? these names these, these are the Salaf and hundreds besides them if not thousands besides them so when they say you are following the Madhab of the Salaf these are whom we are referring to that's what a Salaf he follows this is our Madhab this is what we adhere to this is what we fight to preserve. This is why the Salafi is not led astray by the screams of the rabble. This is why the Salafi does not argue with Ahlul Bid'ah. Because what do we need to argue about? That's the madhab. You want to argue? Look what you're arguing with. You're arguing with Al Athram, Ahmed, Malik, Shafi'i, Fudail, Sufyan, Hamad, Al Asal. At-Tabarani, At-Tabari, Barbahari, Bukhari, Abu Dawood, Ibn Abi Dawood. It's not me you're arguing with when you say you don't like the madhab of the Salaf. It's their madhab that you don't like. It's not me. This is why the Salafi is at ease. Because the work has been done for him. You don't have to rewrite anything. The work was done by these men. That's why Imam Ahmed said what he said at the beginning of the dars when I mentioned his call from Rad al Jahmiya wa Zanadiqa. They made it clear. So they are our salaf. They are our salaf. They are Ashabul Hadith. They are Ahlul Hadith. They are Ahlul Athar. They are the Jama'a, Al Jama'a. They are Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They are at Ta'ifatul Mansura. They are the Firqatul Najiyah, the saved sect. All of this refers to them. All of these titles refer to them. And all of them refers to one body of individuals. Then it refers to those who follow them in every single generation up until today. Whosoever follows that path, the path of the Raziyain, Abu Zura and Abu Hatim, the path of Bukhari, the path of Lalakai, the path of As-Sabuni. And as for the one who criticizes them, then he is a Mubtadi'. Because how can you criticize these men and think that you're upon Haqq? How can you criticize their works and say, oh, look at the Salafis? Look at these individuals reading these books, these dry books of the old. That's what they say. They say, look at these Salafis coming with their Talmud. This is nothing but Zandaqa. These statements themselves are statements of heresy. I doubt that many of them even understand what they're uttering from their mouths. This is the matter of the Salaf. It is not just Barbahari. It is not just Bukhari. It is not just Ahmed. It is a heritage of hundreds and thousands of a'imma, of imams who were united. Look what Bukhari alone said. That's just one man, Bukhari. He said, I sought hadith traveling for them. 
for 46 years. That's one imam. I sought hadith in search of them for 46 years, entering land after land after land, generation after generation after generation, meaning a group of scholars would die. Then another would come after them. He would go and visit them again. Then they would die because they are old. He's still young. So then he'll go back. So he'll go to Basra. He'll go to Baghdad. He'll go to the Hijaz. He'll go to Yemen. He'll go to Egypt. He'll go to Khorasan. He'll go to various parts, Naysabur and other areas, Array and others. And then he'll keep going back. 46 years, Imam al-Bukhari. And he said, and I met over a thousand scholars. He sheikhs, how many? His teachers. How many? Over 1,000. Then he starts naming them. This is the memory of the man. He starts naming them. Imam al records the chain of narration. As, as, as we mentioned, Imam al died in 418 after the Hijrah. So he's talking about al that's when he died, of course, when he lived. It's in the 300s, Imam al Bukhari died in 256, so he's talking about approximately a century before him. So he has a chain of narration going back to Imam al-Bukhari, where Imam al-Bukhari said these words, over a thousand scholars, over 46 years, in various lands of Islam where he traveled. And there is hardly anyone who traveled like Bukhari traveled. That's why he's the Amir, Amir al-Mu'minin fil hadith. He's the leader of the faithful in the collection of hadith. There is no one like Bukhari in hadith. Absolutely no one in his time, after his time, there is no one like him. From his time onwards, there is no one like Bukhari. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Thousand scholars. And then he said, and all of them agreed upon the following points. And then he mentions the aqidah. That's Bukhari. That's just one man. What about Ahmed? What about Malik? What about Awzai? What about Sufyan? What about Muslim? What about Ibn Majah? What about Tirmidhi? What about all of these others? Ibn Abi Asim, Abu Zurra al-Razi, Abu Hatim al-Razi, Imam al-Sabuni. All of these had shiyukh as well, Ibn Batta. All of these had shiyukh also. So what are they doing? They're compiling and they're compiling and they're compiling and they're putting it together and they're codifying the aqidah, the methodology, the, the authentic hadith, the afar of the early salaf so that no one has an opportunity to say, I don't know. Oh, I didn't know. Where do I look? Where do you look? This is where you look. This is what the ummah needs to know. But who's teaching the ummah this? Jamaat al-Tabliq? Ikhwan al-Muslimin? The Khawarij? The Mu'tazila? The Aqlaniyun? The Sufiya? The Quburiya? The Rafida? Who's teaching these books? Except for a small body of Muslims known as the Salafis. And amongst the Salafis, a small group among them from their scholars and their students and the callers. Who, subhanAllah, is teaching these works to the Ummah? How many of the Ummah have even heard the likes of what I've said today? Very few. Very few. But yet this was the methodology and the creed and the belief of the Salaf that they would not move from and they would not alter from and they would not change. They wouldn't move away from it, not even to the thickness of, the, of, 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 of a hair. They wouldn't move. This was what they were upon and they would not shift. And anyone who moved from that which they were upon, the likes of Ahmed, the likes of Barbahari, the likes of Bukhari, the likes of Al-Marwazi, the likes of Lalakai, the likes of Al-Sabuni, anyone who moved away to the right or to the left, they would say he's misguided. Why is he misguided? Because thousands who have come before us have agreed upon this. Thousands, if not tens of thousands. Rather, this was the creed of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum themselves, as Imam al-Bukhari mentioned. When he said that when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, there was somewhere in the region of 114,000 Sahaba when he passed away وسلم, All of them upon this aqeedah. Undivided. 
They agreed upon the creed. Their asal was, their usul were one. This is why they were united and they did not differ. That's why the Sahaba did not differ about the Khawarij. Not one Sahabi, not one. Out of 114,000, they could not convince one. What does that tell you? When the Shia they arose in the time of the Sahaba, when the Qadariya they arose in the time of the Sahaba, when the Murji'a they arose in the time of the Sahaba, they could not even get one companion to join them. Not one. So when these scholars wrote their works and they gathered those narrations and they would say, you know, this was uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, heard this from Abu Huraira. Or Salim, he heard from his father, Abdullah ibn Umar. Or Fulan, he heard from such and such a Sahabi. Or Fulan, he heard from such and such a Sahabi. Or Hassan al-Basri heard from Anas ibn Malik. Or Fulan, Muhammad bin Sirin heard from this Sahabi. They're gathering. Those Tabi'een, they're gathering. What, they're just keeping it to themselves? Who are the Tabi'een passing it on to? They're passing it on to their students. From the Atba'u Tabi'een. Then you enter the era of the likes of Malik. Before Malik al Zuhri. These A'imma are carrying this news and this information and these Afar and these narrations. So it reaches the time of the likes of Malik and Ahmed, Shafi'i. They begin to codify. They begin to pen. They begin to write letters. They begin to refute the Mukhalifin. Then they start writing to the people and writing for the people that which they need to know of the Aqeedah. And this is what we have preserved till this day. Why? Because Allah will not allow this deen to be corrupted. Allah will preserve it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve this religion. So now there come a people who don't like what we're reading because it opposes the very essence of what they're calling to of misguidance. So, when we were in our early days in the da'wah, they used to be very scared to speak against the books. So they wouldn't say, Imam Ahmad is off it. Who would say that except a zindiq? Doubt, you would doubt his religion if he starts attacking Ahmad ibn Hanbal. If a person speaks against Ishaq bin Rahuya from the companions of Imam Ahmad died in 238. You say, did you just say something about Ibra uh, Ishaq bin Ibrahim? Rahway or Rahuya? Did you speak against him? Fear Allah. You spoke against Abdullah ibn Mubarak, who died in 181 after the Hijrah from the great Aimma? They wouldn't. So they would find another way around it. Oh, those books are for those ages. You can't really implement them today. We are not in Baghdad in the second century or third century. We're in Birmingham, 20th century, for example. Or 15th century, if you take in the Hijri calendar. You know, that, that was for their time. We need to think about our religion for our times. So they'd be a bit fearful of directly speaking. But today they're clear. Say, we don't read those books. Those books are dead. Those books are dry. You watch the Salafis walking around with their Talmud. Oh, this is their Bible. So they, this is what they say. But the enemies of those books and the enemies of those scholars, the ruling against them remains the same. And this is why you find the likes of the Salaf. And inshallah, maybe we can mention some more of these narrations next week. But let's just begin with just something just to give you an insight into the position of the Salaf. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in his book, Yawma tabiyaddu wujuhun wa taswaddu wujuh. On that day, Yawm al-Qiyamah, some faces will be white and radiant, and some faces will be dark, will be dark and blackened. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and likewise Abdullah, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma that they said that those faces that will be blackened are Ahlul Bid'a and Dalala and Furqa. 
that those faces that will be that will be blackened and dark on the day of judge on the day of judgment will be Ahlul Bida, the people of innovation, the people of misguidance, and the people of splitting furqa. Abu Hatim al Razi, Rahimahullah Taala, he said, "Alamatu Ahlul Bida, al Waqiyatu fi Ahlul Afar." So he said, Rahimahullah. That the distinguishing sign of Ahlul Bid'a is that they revile Ahlul Athar. Who are Ahlul Athar? These names that we went through. That they will revile them. They don't like them. Because those books, they clarify their errors. Ahmed bin Sinan al Qattan, Rahimahullah, he said, Laysa fi dunya mubtadi'un illa wa huwa yabghud Ahlul Hadith. That there is not in the dunya an innovator except that he hates the people of hadith. So when a man innovates into the religion, then the sweetness of hadith is stripped from his heart. Qutayba bin Sa'id, rahimahullahu ta'ala from the early salaf, he said, Man khalafa ha'ula'i, yani ahlul hadith. And whomsoever opposes those men, meaning Ahlul Hadith, those scholars that we mentioned, then know that he is an innovator. Abu Uthman, Ismail al Sabuni, Rahimahullah, the author of the, one of the books that we mentioned earlier, Aqidatul Salaf, Ashabul Hadith, he said, from the signs, from the clear signs of Ahlul Bid'a upon its followers, that is clear to see. And the, and the most apparent of their features and their signs is the severity of their enmity towards those who carry the narrations of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their hatred for them and their belittlement of them. Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, rahimahullah, from the Tabi'een, died in the year 131. He said, I do not know today, I do not know today anyone from Ahl al-Ahwa except that he will argue with that which is ambiguous from the revelation. Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala he said the Ahl al-Bid'a that they have clear signs. Number one that they ascribe to Islam and the Sunnah that which they themselves have, has, have innovated. They ascribe it to the Sunnah. They ascribe to Islam and the Sunnah what they have innovated, whether in speech or action or belief. Number two, that they are fanatical blind followers of their opinions. So they do not return to the truth, even when it is made clear to them. And thirdly, they hate the scholars of Islam and the religion. Waqir, who is from the shiukh, as I recall, of Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah. He said that whosoever seeks the hadith only to strengthen his deviated opinion is a person of bid'ah. Because that will, we're going to come to that, inshallah. Because Ahlul Bid'ah, one of, one of the things that they do is that they will innovate into the religion, their bid'ah. Then they will start looking for anything in the sunnah that they can use in an ambiguous and unclear manner to say, there's our proof for doing such and such. Ahlul Bid'a, this is, all of them are united upon this. They begin with their Bid'a, but to convince the people, they need to go to the Quran or to the Sunnah to look for something vague, something ambiguous that supports their position. And Ahlul Bid'a, they are united in their hatred. They are united. And this is why, in Asl Sunnah of the Raziyain, Rahimahum Allah, that they say, that the zanadiqa, that they hate and they wish to see the extinguishing of the afar of Allah's Messenger وسلم, How do they do it? By their hatred. The zanadiqa, they hate the people of hadith and sunnah. So they hate that these books be read and these books be taught. And this is why so many people are astray in the ummah today. And this is why it is incumbent upon us and upon the students of knowledge 
to open up these books and to teach it to the students of knowledge, to the beginners and to the general folk. Barakallahu feekum. And upon that, we'll finish for today. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. The proceeding has been a presentation of Al Maktabatu Salafiyya and SalafiBookstore.com. Wa jazakumullahu khair. Wa barakallahu feekum. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.